Salam alaykum everybody. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. So the chosen title for this talk was Tawakkul 2.0. Uh, putting our trust in Allah Azza wa Jal on a higher level. Upgrading our reliance, our trust in Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So why are we talking about this? Because we're all believers and every believer believes in Allah and trusts in Allah to the degree that they've accepted his way of life, at least in principle, at least in commitment, Islam. But even though we've done that, we've entered the garden of tawakkul and we all benefit from it as believers, there can still be segments in our life or we will encounter in our life that plague us with worries about the future. And that's completely natural, completely normal. And it's not just because we're surrounded by uncertainty. It's also because we are certain that we will face challenges and adversity. Allah promised it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, in one of my favorite ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Ibn Mas'ud says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one time he drew a box in the ground. And then he drew a line starting from within the box, extending out of it. And then he drew short lines on the right and the left of this straight line. And he said, this is the human being. This is the human being. وَهَذَا أَجَلُهُ مُحِيطٌ بِهِ and this is his lifespan, it has him surrounded. No one is going to outlive, escape their lifespan. And everyone's hopes will be beyond what their life will allow. He says in this straight line is amaluhu, his hopes in life, his wishes. They extend outside your life. Your life will interrupt them. You will not be able to have all that you hope for in this life and you don't know when the interruption will take place. But what about the short lines on the right and the left of our lifespan? He says, وَهَذِهِ الْأَعْرَاضِ And these are the interruptions, if you will. The, the adversities, the, the difficulties, the hardships. He says, إِن نَجَى مِنْ عَرَضٍ نَهَشَهُ الْآخَرِ If a person, imagine like you're tight roping through life, if you're able to escape one, you are stung by the other. There's no escaping it. We're all going to face something. There are the people stung by the anguish of not finding a job. And there are those who are tormented because they hate their job. Right? And there are those struggling to have children. And there are those struggling because of the misguidance of their children. And there are those struggling because of the health conditions of their children. And then there are those who are struggling to get married. <laughs> and there are those who are trying to escape their marriage. Everyone's got something. No one will ever escape these interruptions, these adversities. So if life won't get better, let's break it to you. If life won't get easier, then what's the solution? The solution is for you get, to get stronger. How do you get stronger? By armoring up. You know, youth these days like saying, he's built different. She's built different. Yeah, you build out your armor differently. That armor is not false hopes about the nature of life. That armor is trusting Allah and seeking his help to be able to withstand the stings of life. That's where tawakkul comes into play. This world was not designed to please you. It was designed to drive you to Allah. Through the vulnerability of life, we realize our necessity of turning to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are then told in the Quran that if you do turn to me, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Allah will be enough for whoever turns to Him. But that there's a caveat here. If you keep reading throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah, Allah will always be enough for those who trust Him, those who rely on Him, 
on the condition that they trust and rely upon him properly. The great scholar Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, and you will never exhibit proper tawakkul in Allah without four things. Consider these the pillars of tawakkul, the four legs that tawakkul stands on. He says the first of them is deep knowledge about Allah's perfect names and attributes. Knowing Allah is not intuitive. Yes, we have a fitrah. Yes, we know we have a higher power. But you can't know him deeply without him revealing to you something about his reality. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's through revelation that you deepen your knowledge about Allah. So that you can trust him. That's why Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Belonging to Allah is everything unseen. He knows all the unseen means also the seen he knows. He knows all the unseen. وَإِلَيْهِ يُرْجَعُ الْأَمْرُ كُلُّهُ And all matters are ultimately decided by him. فَعْبُدْهُ وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَيْهِ So worship him and put your trust in him. Why put your trust in him? Because he knows the unseen. Until I know for certain just how much Allah knows, it's going to be hard to trust him. You know, like if there's low stakes, if I want to find out who stole my pen, I can ask a kid if the kid's reliable somewhat. But when I want to find out who stole my car, I'm not going to ask a little kid. The stakes are higher. How do you trust someone with your existence without knowing them deeply? Then you read the Quran and you say, oh man, Allahu Akbar. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ No one knows the unseen but him. If I trust anybody else, they don't know what's going to happen five seconds from now. If I trust myself too much, I'm lying to myself. I don't know either. But he knows everything that's locked away in the future, he knows it. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And he knows every last thing on, on land and in the seas. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And there's not a leaf that falls except that he knows about it. The philosophers will tell you if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it really make a sound? We tell them the question is wrong. Not trees. Leaves don't fall except that Allah knows about them. Every last blade of grass that sways, he knows about. وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ Look at the layers of reassurance in the same verse about Allah's knowledge. And there is not a seed in the darknesses, plural, of the earth except that he knows about it. So a seed under the dark of the night, at the bottom of the ocean, under the mud of the ocean, he knows. وَلَا رَطُبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ And there is nothing dry, nothing moist, except that it's all recorded in a clear book. That does something inside. When you give yourself time to acquaint yourself with Allah's perfect knowledge and then his perfect power, because what's the point of knowing if you can't do anything about it, right? إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When he wants anything done, he says to it, be, and it is. You know what that means? That means whatever is, it's because he said be, which means he wanted it to happen. It was for a wisdom as well. You know, there's a beautiful hadith in Bukhari and Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, the people before you, among them was a man who as he was dying, he gathered his children. And he said to them, what kind of father was I to you? They said, khayru ab, you were the best father ever. He said, what I want to admit to you something. I've never done any good in my life. May Allah protect us. He came clean only in that moment. And so I need you to do something if I've been the best dad. When I die, I need you to promise to burn my body. And after I become a coal, cinder, crush me, cremate me until I become ash. And when I become ash, I need you to wait. You wait until it is a windy day. And when it's a windy day, I want you to throw half of the ashes in the sea and half of the ashes to the wind. Then he explains why. لَإِنْ قَدِرَ عَلَيَّ رَبِّي If my Lord is able to grab a hold of me, he will punish me like he never punished anybody. I know I deserve it. And he made each of them swear that they would do it. 
and when he died, they did it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَقَالَ اللَّهُ كُنْ Then Allah said, be. This is a fast forward to the Day of Judgment, right? Allah said, be, فَإِذَا هُوَ رَجُلٌ قَائِمٌ All of a sudden, he's a man standing again. Allah told the, the sea to return its particles and the wind to bring its share back. He's a man standing again. And Allah says to him, أَيْ فُلْ أَيْ فُلَان O oh, individual, what drove you to do all this? It's a whole long story. He said to him, ya Rabb. My fear of you, you made me do it, O oh Allah. The Prophet wasallam said, فَمَا لَبِثَ إِلَّا أَن تَغَمَّدَهُ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ It was not long, meaning eventually, Allah enveloped the man in his mercy. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says that if you gather all the narrations of this hadith, it is clear that this is the story or the beginning of the story of the last man we know to enter paradise and exit the fire, that's him. But the power of Allah. But that's only, and time will not allow us to really cover this and do it justice, that's only a part of deepening your knowledge about Allah is through revelation. How do you activate that knowledge inside you so that you feel it? so that you, it transforms you, you act on it. What activates your trust that Allah is as He said? It's actually through devoting yourself to Him. How do the facts become guidance? Through action. Because knowledge plus action becomes faith. That's the formula. And that's why when Abu Sulaiman al-Darani rahimahullah was asked, how do you get to know God? He said, by obeying Him. Because when you don't obey Allah, the knowledge you have theoretically about Him, your heart bleeds it. You bleed the glorification of God from your heart with disobedience. So how do you get to know God? He didn't say read the Qur'an. That's true. But he said by obeying Him. Then they said to him, how do we get ourselves to obey Him? Qala bihi. He said, through Him. In other words, oh Allah, help me obey you. So you obey Him, so you get an experienced nearness of him and certainty about him. So you obey him more, so you learn about him more. And it becomes this beautiful, virtuous cycle. That's knowledge of Allah, that's only one of the four. I'm going to have to speed through the rest now. The second of them, Ibn al-Qayyim says, the second pillar of tawakkul, to upgrade your tawakkul, you need unwavering conviction in destiny. You have to know everything's predetermined. Your, our lives are predetermined. Our rizq, our provisions are predetermined. The, in one hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, if Allah were to punish everyone in the heavens and everyone on earth, he would do so without wronging them. He wouldn't be unfair if he did this because the favors we owe to Allah are more than the good deeds we do to, for Allah. Right? So if he were to punish the best of the worshippers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would not be unfair. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُ رَحِمَهُمْ But if he were to have mercy on him, on them, and that's his preference, we know that, his mercy would be wider than all their deeds can ever be eligible for. But this, the next part of the hadith is what I want. He said, and if one of you were to spend Uhud in gold. Has anyone spent, you guys ever seen Mount Uhud? No way, not even close, right? No one's ever done that. If you were to donate Mount Uhud in gold, Allah would not accept it from you until you believe in Qadr, in destiny. To the point that you are sure that what hit you is never going to miss you. And what missed you is never going to hit you. And that if you were to die upon other than this belief, this is the same hadith continuing, if you were to die upon other than this, this belief, Allah would admit you to the fire. This is actually uh, an indirect mandate of mercy from Allah. You're obligated to trust me. Of the fundamentals of your faith is that you cannot leave yourself outside of the tawakkul of Allah. Don't let shaitan play games with you. Because you know, throughout the Qur'an, shaitan went to Adam, said, oh, he, check out that kingdom, uh, eternal life, the tree. Uh, and he came to us with the same thing. Fear for your life, fear for your rizq, fear poverty, like Adam, alayhi salam, same thing.
So the Quran came to say your life is with Allah and your rizq is with Allah and you need to be absolutely sure of that so that you don't cut corners for the sake of your life, your well-being, your livelihood, your provisions. As the Prophet wasallam said that in Ruh al-Qudus, how much time do I have left? <laughs> you guys are not going anywhere for a while? Muslim prayer number three, Asr, you guys doing that one? Five minutes, okay. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Holy Spirit, of course we believe in the Holy Spirit, right? That's Jibreel alayhi salam. Others confuse the angel with the messenger with God in a blender. That's not us. We believe in the Holy Spirit, but that he's the angel that Allah created. The Holy Spirit inspired within me that no soul will ever die without living its lifespan to the fullest and collecting its provisions in its totality, entirely. Notice, life risk, life risk. Why so much about life risk? Because shaitan comes at you from life risk. So he says, and so, so what? What's the point of this fact? The hadith says, so fear Allah and beautify your requests. Don't cut corners. The good that's with Allah is never obeyed. You don't pull a fast one by disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. I remember Sa'id ibn Jubayr, rahimahullah, he comes to mind now. He was persecuted by al-Hajjaj, the, the governor or the Khalifa at the time. And al-Hajjaj said to him, stop doing the right thing. Like stop speaking truth to power. <laughs> because your life is in my hands. I'm about to execute you. You know what Sa'id said to him? If I believed that my life was in your hands, I would not have worshipped anybody but you. What an answer, right? You're not my God. You can be my spouse, you can be my boss, you can be whatever, you're not my God. So that's number two, unwavering conviction in Qadr. Pens have been lifted, the pages have dried. Number three is to seek the means. You have to respect the cosmic order. Yes, everything is up to the will of Allah, but Allah gave you enough of a will, enough agency to be held accountable, to be liable. The Prophet ﷺ taught you to put your trust in Allah, but he wore armor on the battlefield. He poured water on his head when he was fasting. He sought medical treatment from experts and specialists, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Imam Ahmad one time saw a bunch of people sitting in the masjid, masjid basically specialized in unemployment, saying we put our trust in Allah. We are people of tawakkul. He said, these people have not smelled the scent of knowledge. Nobody's more ignorant than these guys. He said, did they not open Allah's book and hear Allah saying to Maryam alayhi salam, وَهُزِّي إِلَيْكِ بِجِذْعِ nakhla, Shake towards you the trunk of the palm tree. Ripe edible dates will fall. Think about that. A man cannot get dates off of a palm tree by shaking. You have to go get it. This is a woman who just gave birth, why is Allah telling her that for us? Just do your part. Try your best. That's all I ask of you. So seeking the means, number four, and finally, disbelieving in those means. Allah made these means, these avenues effective. Allah does not need them to bring about the desired results. Allah made knives cut, but he can stop the knife from cutting Ismail alayhi salam. Allah made fire burn. He can deactivate the burning element of fire on Ibrahim alayhi salam. O oh, fire be calm upon Ibrahim. I used to know, of, I heard of a really good brother, uh, that the doctor said to him, your life relies on this medication. You have to take it on time or else that's it. You're, 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 this is fatal. So when he heard this, he used to take the pills and throw them on the ground before, inshallah, he dusted it off, yani. but he would take, and then he would take the pill. People think he's crazy. They're like, what are you doing? He said, no, no. I just want to remind myself that these pills cannot even help themselves. So how can they help me? It is only by Allah's permission. He was protecting the tawakkul of his heart. And that's what tawakkul really is. It's a trust of the heart, even though we're going to seek the means that are in front of us. If you do those four, 
your tawakkul is complete, in my final 60 seconds, I have two disclaimers. Number one, just because you perform proper tawakkul doesn't mean you will always get the outcome you want in this world, right? You sought the medication, you sought the treatment, but Allah said, no, enough for you. I want you in Jannah now. That's when you just trust, defer, delegate. His choice for me is better than my choice for myself. This is extremely important. You know, I told you Saeed ibn Jubayr said, I don't worship you, my life is not in your hands. That same Saeed was executed. Did, he, did his trust in Allah waver? Didn't waver. One of the last things the biographers mentioned, Saeed said, Oh Allah, grant me proper reliance on you. And let me always assume the best of you. Meaning whatever the outcome is, allow me to assume the best of you regarding the outcome you chose. So that's the first disclaimer. The outcome may not be what you want. That's another form, a post tawakkul. The second disclaimer is, don't be of those who cheat themselves for their tawakkul. What do I mean? If you do these four, for Allah to take care of your dunya, He's going to keep His promise. He's going to take care of your dunya. But the best place to employ tawakkul is in your deen. As they say, the best thing you can ask Allah for is what He asked you for, right? And so the best thing to rely on Allah for is to be better in your relationship with Him with your prayers, with your character, with your determination, with your resolve, with your resolve, resisting the evils outside. That is the greatest thing we have tawakkul in. And if there was anything greater to seek out and trust in Allah for, it would have been in Al-Fatiha, Ihdina al-Sirat al-Mustaqeem. But it is the greatest pursuit and needs the greatest assistance. And so use your tawakkul there before anywhere else. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين